Welcome to the High Bandwidth Word Podcast, transformative studies in the Word of God. I'm Pastor John Harrison. This is my podcast. Do you ever wonder about the future? Well, you're in luck. This season, we are studying future things revealed in the Word of God. I hope you're excited about that. Let's look forward to checking these things out. Let's fight the good fight of faith as we study future things. Take your Bibles and let's, I'm going to go, go to 1 Corinthians 3 again, where we were at last time. I have a couple other things to share here. Um, about the Bema seat, the reward seat, uh, just a, I would call them finishing touches uh, to uh, to this uh, uh, this um, part of the lesson we're looking at. So just to remind you, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 8, it says, Now he that planteth, and he that watereth are one. So we're all together in this. But the concept is, and every man shall, what? Receive his own reward according to his own labor. So the function of what you do uh, is what reward is about. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's repeated over and over and over and over and over again uh, that uh, we were, you know, we, we, you know, Paul repeats it at least twice. I guess that's over and over. But he talks about the judgment seat of Christ and he says that um, we'll all receive for the things done in this body, what we've done in this body, what we've done in, the, in this life. Um, what I do know, go to Philippians chapter 2, or 1, Philippians 1. One thing we can say, regardless of whatever transpires. You know, I know um, we can... One of, the, one of the things I think shuts down more Christians than anything else is guilt. Or the feeling <laughs> that since I haven't done something, I can't do something. All right, Or that I have done something bad, that I can't do something good. And the issue is that's not that's not the way God sees it. Um, I've, and I've ministered with a lot of young people through the years, and I've dealt with some kids who have you know not you know not none of your kids, trust me. <laughs> I won't talk about them. But if they are, I'm not telling. Them, so, but uh, you know they've made some bad choices. And what I've what I've said, uh, I remember saying at least at least three different individuals that righteousness, your relationship with God, begins with a decision. A choice. As you choose to walk God's way, and God is already there. He's not been away from you, you've been away from Him. And He's always right there. And so, like, as soon as you're walking down the wrong path, as soon as you turn, the Lord's standing right there. And He's ready to bless and bring about good things. You still live with the fruit of of the things maybe you have planted. You know, you plant the seeds that maybe are bad fruit. And they still, you know, they'll bear fruit eventually. Sometimes they bear fruit very quickly. Sometimes it's many, many years later. You know, David is an example of a man whose heart was after God's own heart. But he made some very poor decisions, right? But God blessed him. He just had to turn to God. And you, the Psalms are all about that. You see him pouring out his heart over the things that perhaps he has, well, he's done wrong. Yeah, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. David didn't understand it, but David had sinned. A sin that was, the penalty was death. And God did not put that to his account, and David knew it wasn't put to his account, and he was on a path of blessing. However, David's sin bore fruit, his child died all right and there were other things too he, he went through a lot of difficulties because of those things however god was blessing so the issue is what you know what i said is so righteousness begins really with a choice a, a decision a heart decision you know i lord i want to i want to start living for you or i want to i want to turn my life around at that moment the lord's right there with you so don't don't feel guilty if for some reason you, you know, wherever path you find yourself on, do you feel like, you know, you know we all, we've all wasted time. We've all wasted years. We've all wasted days. That's part, of, that's part of our lives until we grow up. Life is all about growing up. As what Paul said in his life. He said, you know, he said he had a battle between sin, right? I mean, he says in Romans 7, I find, you know, the things I want to do, I can't do, and the things I do want to do, I, or I'll just say, the things I should do, I can't do, and the things I shouldn't do, I do. I find within me a law. That no matter what I'm doing, there's a struggle between this flesh, right? And this flesh generates a lot of corruptible things. 
but the spirit are good things, and it's it's just part of part of life. And 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 you know that's why Paul says in Romans twelve, I beseech you, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Now that's that's a I mean that means that there's not that w- that's, that means that we're not always there. The Corinthians were carnal, right? That's part of it. But there was a call to be saints, to live like a saint. Um, it's it's part of it's part of the Christian experience, Christian life. We're not perfect. Only Jesus Christ was, and He's the standard that we're supposed to be moving towards, right? So, anyways, it is it is. You know, so don't feel. And I think Satan uses guilt to shut people down, right? God has paid for the sin through Jesus Christ, and now the moment is just an issue to make a decision. You are you are holy and beloved in the Father, in Jesus Christ. That's who you are. And God wants you to see yourself as that way and to begin acting that way. All right, that's sort of the, the thing. Philippians 1 says this. Okay. Paul says, huh, verse 20. Look what he says here. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, what's he say there? That in nothing I shall be ashamed. That's his desire and his hope, right? Desire and his hope. So, but, but here's what he does then. So because of that, he says, you know, I've turned a path. You know, Paul, by the way, says about his own life, man, I've made some terrible decisions. I had people put to death, right? That's before I knew Christ. Sin had, you know, Christ's blood had taken care of it. God has counted him worthy, who is worse than the worst. Is what he says over in Second or First Timothy or Second Timothy, concerning himself. Right, it's First Timothy, concerning himself. He says, you know, I, I, I wasn't a kind of. I mean, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm the, I'm the. Uh, what does he say? I'm the greatest. Uh, I can't even say it. Say it. Hold your place right there. I'll, re- I'll just read it to you. First Timothy chapter, um, 15, one verse fifteen. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. That's what I'm going to say. I'm the worst of the worst. I'm chief of the sinners. Why? Because I persecuted the church. I, I went after people. I went after the believers. I, I, I had them put to death. I had them killed. But it's under the blood of Christ. Everything we do that's in our flesh is under the blood of Christ. It doesn't just before salvation. It's all our lives. So the issue is to realize it. Turn around. Start walking the Lord's way. And at that moment, God begins to bless and bring around good things. So you don't have to feel... I mean. Uh, the weight, you know, what's Paul saying in no, Philippians again? You're in Philippians, right? He says in Philippians 3, he says, I press, or it says, uh, verse uh, uh, 12, not as though I already attained, I haven't made it yet, either we're already perfect, I'm not exactly what I need to be yet, I'm not mature as much as I should be, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, I want to get a hold of, that for which also I'm apprehended of Christ, that which Christ has gotten hold of me and said I am. He says, he's got a, you know, he got a hold of me, right? I'm a sinner saved by grace. grace. I am in the love. I, I am I'm accepted in the beloved. I am holy. I am pure. I am righteous. That's what God says. But Paul says, I haven't made it there yet. I haven't made it there yet. But verse 13 is what he says. Brethren, here's, you know, I want to tell I count not myself to have apprehended. I haven't got a hold of it all yet. But this one thing I do. This is the thing I do. And this is the thing you should do. And this is what you all should do. Forgetting what? Those things which are behind. Because those things which are behind are anchors. Whether they're good or bad things. You can hang on to the glory of yesterday and forget about the moment you're in right now. And for, you know, not see the things you should be doing. Or you can hang on to the anchor of the sin and the problems of yesterday and the poor decisions of yesterday. And then you can't make the right decisions today. God says, so let go. Let go. Brethren, I count on myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth under those things which are before. I keep my eyes on the prize, what he's saying here. So it goes on to say, for I press toward the mark for the prize. Of the high calling of God, what? In Christ, in Christ Jesus. Jesus. God has says, this is who I am. This is what's in store for me. This is who, this is what I have for you. This is, this is, this is who you are. And God says, reach for that prize. Press towards it. 
The idea is the runner leaning into the tape, right? Leaning into the tape as is going and not slowing down, not l stepping back, but pressing towards the mark. What happens in, in a race if you start to relax at the end? A lot of times people get passed up, right? Because somebody else is leaning into the race, leaning into the tape. Now, fortunately, we're not in a race against each other. Amen? Okay, amen to that, right? Because we've been already blown away by a lot of the f martyrs and folks like that, the Apostle Paul. He's, they've already run it, won it. You're, you're not even going to come in second, you know? So it's like, uh, because others, but the issue is we all can receive the prize. Just to lean into it. But you've got to let go of the things of the past. Why I say that? Because of the Bema Seat. That's what's going on. We have things done in our body. There's good and there's bad. There's gold, silver, precious stones. There's wood, hay, and stubble. And the wood, hay, and stubble, what God says is going to burn up. Never to remember it anymore. So here we are at the Bema Seat. So again, the Bema Seat... Here we are, here's life, there's rapture. I'm gonna talk about that other part in a little bit. <coughs> rapture, and we're taken here to the Bema seat. The, the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. This is life, this is rapture. So it's right after the rapture. And this is in the second heaven. Do I have this, these are the, here's life for some and they've died, they want to be with the Lord. And this is, I'm going to call it the intermediate state. Before the rapture, I think I spelled that wrong, intermediate. Immediate. You can't read my writing anyway, so why do I care? <laughs> <laughs> so the intermediate state, right? So this is, you know, these are people who have died. We ask from the bodies, we present them with the Lord, right? At the rapture, we all come together and we're off to the demon seat, right? By the way, when you, at the rapture and at death, we leave this old flesh behind, right? This body's going to change. At the rapture, the body's changed. It's changed from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortal, from weak to powerful, to, to you know, to be holy and glorified, just like Christ's body. So when you go to the Bema Sea, when we get to the Bema Sea, we're all standing there, robes of white, okay, if that's what you want to think of it. You know, you're, you're in your glorified body. You don't have that old flesh. That old flesh is gone. There's no more fear, like, and, and, you know, there's no more, no, more, no more guilt, okay? Sin is taken care of. This is an issue of reward, right? It's still, I think, a hard experience because we're standing before our Lord and Savior, and he's going to say, you know, you know what's the thing in the gospel? Say, you know, what, what the other thing is, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what we all want to hear, right? And there appears in our times we have not been good, that we haven't been faithful, right? That's just part of life, okay? Um, it's part of a Christian, it's part of being sin-cursed creatures. It's the reason that Satan looks at you and goes like, you're nothing. You know, as pastor was talking about on Wednesday night, he was talking about the uh, Balaam, or no, uh, Sunday night. It was, that Sunday, it was that Sunday morning, Sunday night. Just last week, whatever it was. I talk about Balaam. You know, Balaam, Balak, and Baal, right? And, uh, and, uh, and that whole thing about trying to curse Israel. And God says, I don't see anything wrong with them. They look good to me. And Satan's going, what are you talking about? You know, well, what is he sees himself in them because he's their people. You know, and he says, in Christ, God's, God sees Christ in us. And he doesn't see that. But the issue is for reward. It's about, the, you know, we're going to receive for our own labor the work that we have done. So it's a reward. And in that process, you're going to see stuff burn up. And you're going to realize, I'm going to realize that, wow, that's an awful lot of stuff. Right? And I think that's going to be a hard thing to deal with for a moment. Probably a little longer than a twinkling of an eye. But it's not much time when you compare it to eternity, right? Everything will be great after that. Philippians 1, that's what Paul says. Philippians 1, verse 20. According to my earnest expectation, my hope, Philippians 1.20. I turned there already, sorry. Philippians 1.20. According to my earnest expectation, my hope, that in nothing I, shall be nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always. So now also, Christ shall be magnified in my body, 
whether it be by what? Life, Life or, death. or death. So regardless of either situation, Christ is going to be magnified in my body. That's what Paul's earnest, that's what his desire was. That people would see. Magnification, right? It's like a magnifying glass, right? So when you put a magnifying glass on something, you see something better. I got glasses on. I see you better because I have them on. Okay? I definitely see my Bible better because the bottom part is the part that's really important for this part. I don't need these to see you quite well. Top part's not much, but it does magnify a little bit. You get a little crisper. Okay, you look a little, well, some of you look a little worse when I put them on, but. Because <laughs> I see you a little better. <laughs> some people caught it, so. Most of you look much better, so. Yeah. <laughs> According, anyways, that Christ is magnified. It means it makes it bigger, that it's seen clearly. Is Christ being seen clearly in our lives? Because that's what the Bema Seed's about. Okay, that's what the Bema Seed about, is about. What's the. Uh, today's message, Aaron is preaching this morning, right? You're not? I thought you were. Okay. I think he's preaching this morning. Today's message is something about the fruit of the Spirit, I think. Right? What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love. love. Je- what is God? Love. God is love. It is God, so Christ in me, when they see Christ, they see love. They see Christ. They see Him, who He is. Right, and that's what the beam is, you know, sees about. It. And so we're being rewarded for okay, how much Christ have you allowed to pour out of you? It's love. Love is that 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 the key. That the the the. the yes, by the way, that's how eternity operates. How does this world operate? Who designed this world you live in right now? <laughs> he's the Same prince, the power of the air, right? He's he's the he's the one who designed this world we live in. And what does he operate on? If you go back and look at his sin, it was pride. He was perfect in beauty. All right? And his wisdom was corrupted. It's wisdom, it's pride, it's beauty. It's the three things that drive human society today. All right? Get all you can get. Okay? Be all you can be. There's the beautiful people, right? There's all those folks like that, you know? They all, you know, rise to the top. It's all about wisdom. Doesn't matter what you do to somebody. Just so, you know, you look really smart if you capture a lot of money, and it doesn't matter how you get there. I mean, how many people would you step on to get there? All right, it doesn't matter. Okay. But how's God's eternity operate? Well, it operates on love. How many people do you lift up? How many people do you care about? How many people have you uh, uh, um, brought good things to? In eternity, that reward's about that. Being in a position of authority allows you to love more people. The higher you are up in God's heavenly government is the more you can love. Because love means you have to take those below you and lift them up. You put them first. Right? That's what love is. You put them first. Jesus Christ, who is the head of all things, what did he do? He, he commended his love towards us. And that while we were sinners, Christ died. He demonstrated his love to us. That's his. He took and lifted all of us up, even those who despise him and will despise him to the grave. All of creation. It's about love. It's the. It's the. It's the. It's how it operates. All right. Go to. Um, feed, well, do 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 do. Go. Yeah, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go. Try to find it. Oh, First Corinthians nine. First Corinthians nine. Trying to look at my mishmash map here where, where I want to go. First Corinthians nine. So so as we as we you know so some you know so some uh, so so how do I build this reward in my life you know you know how 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 does it need to happen? But Paul says something interesting here in First Corinthians nine verse uh, we'll say verse sixteen. You know it says uh, we'll start in verse sixteen. First Corinthians nine sixteen. For though I preach the gospel. I have nothing to, go, to glory of. You know, I'm preaching the gospel, right? That's my job. I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Paul says, you know, I'm an apostle. God has given me something to do, and I have to do it. Right? It's my job. Right? So it's your job. So your job is to be a husband, a wife, a co-worker. You have jobs, right? We have different tasks to do, Right? But just being a dad, just being a husband, just being a wife, just being a co-worker, just being a pastor, just being a teacher, right? 
It has to be just doing those things. You know, you may have it as you have, it's a necessity, perhaps. You have to do it, whatever. But just doing them doesn't get your reward. Look what it says in verse 17. For if I do this thing, what? Willingly. Willingly. What's that there? I have a reward. Okay. I have a reward. So if I do this willingly, I do it for the Lord. I do it because I want to, you know, the Lord, the Lord is important in my life. I do it willingly. Not because, you know, it's just sort of like giving. But to say in 1 Corinthians, a little earlier in verse eight, chapter 8, talks about, you know, oh, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 8, sorry. Talks about giving. If I do this thing, if God loveth a cheer, cheerful giver. You know, it's willing. Every that purpose in his heart, you know, is, is a willing gift. The Old Testament uh, um, sacrifices, the willing sacrifices are the ones God loved and cared about, right? It's what, what, he, what, he, what he wanted. But if I do this willingly, I have a reward. And Paul says, he has another. But if I do it against my will, well, guys, I have a dispensation of gospel committed unto me. God gave me something I got to do. If I do it, if I just do it, just to do it, okay, God gave me to do it, I'll you know, be get done, but I don't get a reward, you know. So I, I, I encourage you, okay, if you're doing ministry, I hope all of you are, and if you want to find out, you're doing lots of ministries, some of you are, all right, if there's things that are not bringing you joy, you're grudgingly about doing it, give it to somebody else. Because if it's not willing of your heart, you're not getting a reward from that, right? You may be doing it, but doing it without your heart doesn't have eternal value. You might get the job done, but do it from your heart. You will see that over and over and over again. Let me look at Colossians 3 real quick. Colossians 3. God's always with your heart. Colossians 3, verse 23. In the context of being a dad and a father and a co-worker, a servant, a child. In that context. Verse 23. And whatsoever you do, what? Do it, do it heartily. heartily as to the Lord and not unto the men. Why? Knowing that of the Lord you shall what? Receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong which he hath done. There's no respect to person. There's a judgment, okay? But it's, a, it's not a judgment for sin. Up in verse 17, it says, What should you do in word or deed? Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. It is how it's done, right? It's from the motivation of what it's done. Just doing it doesn't count. So building a hospital, throwing money in an offering plate, coming and working at the church every day, and you do it because you're looking to score points. Ain't happening. It's got to be from your heart. All right? It's got to be from your heart. Without your heart, it's of no value. Because God's looking at Christ being manifested in you. That means there's love. That means there's joy. There's peace coming out of that. It's something that God produces willingly. All right. Go back to Job chapter 1. All right. So this, we're going to switch uh, subjects. On, or not switch subjects. Same thing. Now, this is one of these things where it's like, I'm just, I'm going to tell you that I think this is what's going on. All right? I can't prove it. But, like, the question is, where does this Bema seat occur? Where does this judgment happen? Right? Um, uh, I do not believe it's in the third heavens. Yes, because there's a first, Corinthians, or first Thessalonians talks about us being taken, presented to God the Father. All right? So, it's, I still believe it's in, this, in the second heavens. And I think it's here that we see an indication of it in Job chapter 1. So in Job chapter 1, verse 6, there is a place in this universe, and why I know it's in this universe is because Satan chapter shows up at this place. So he doesn't show up in the third heavens. So there's a place in this universe where there is a place of judgment. Okay. So first, uh, Job 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And what? Satan came also among them. And then it says, The Lord said unto, uh, said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then, thou? then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro to the earth and from walking up and down in it. So it's not in the earth. right? He came from there. It's somewhere else in the universe. All right? Look, it says there in Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2. Again, you have the same sort of thing. 
So it's a place where the sons of God, the angels, come. So Job 2, verse 1. Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. So the Lord here is not God the Father, right? Because God the Father is not in the presence of sin, right? In fact, that's the, the whole thing that led to the separation of a third heaven and a second heaven is because this rebellion in the heavenly places. And so God really put a containment vessel. You call it the universe, right? That's what you call it. God calls it the deep in Genesis chapter 1. It's the, the deep, and it was dark in there, very dark in there, because God the Father, who is light, was not in there. All right, so he had to put light in. He had to create light in there. Job, continue Job 2. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down it. And then God talks to him about, you know, uh, Job, things like that. So there's a place in the universe where the angels gather to present themselves before God, all right? And, and to basically talk about, share what they've been doing. It's a place of, of judgment. Go to Isaiah chapter 9. So I think we have an identification of that place in Isaiah. Now, if you were just uh, watching the news this last week, uh, there's a, if you're uh, into the, uh, uh, what the, you know, the SETI type of stuff, which is uh, extraterrestrial uh, uh, life and stuff like that, uh, they were just in the news where they found in this one particular solar system, three Earth-like planets, all right? And uh, they're all excitement about it, right? Places that could system find? Set oh seven. Set there's seven planets, three of which are Earth like. Right. So they don't care about the rest of them. There's lots of planets out there. Okay. In fact there are lot there are planets were there before there were stars. I'm just gonna tell you that. Okay. That's the weird part. That's the opposite of uh, theory. Because God's you know, God put the stars in there afterwards, right? The angels were already there, they are already functioning. This place where the angels came was already existing long before um, the, the suns and stuff. The stars in our universe are artificial light. You know, just like these light bulbs are artificial light. The stars are artificial light because God is light. Everything else is artificial. So in the new heaven, new earth, you're going to need something. You need the sun. No. There's no need of the sun. Why? Because we don't need artificial light. Because God is here, His light, and He'll fill the universe with His light. There will not be any shadow with God's light. Artificial light produces shadows. God's light, there is no shadow. It permeates everywhere. So, like your shadow right now, because eventually there won't be a shadow. So all those little you know, stories of shadows running around there, there's not going to be any shadows. Okay? And so if you like shadows, you can't do shadow puppets if there's light everywhere. Just saying that, okay? Isaiah 9, verse 14. Or, sorry, Isaiah, oh, I don't want Isaiah. I want Isaiah 14. Sorry, Isaiah 14, sorry. Isaiah 9 is another awesome passage. But. Isaiah 14, we'll start in verse 9. Okay, so here is the, the five I wills of Satan. All right, the things that he was in his heart, in his mind, that uh, when he uh, led his rebellion, when he basically got a lot of the angels, one third of them to follow him, uh, this was what, was he, what he was thinking. This is his corrupted wisdom, all right? Ezekiel 28 talks about that he was perfect in beauty. Uh, he was awesome. He was amazing. He was the top, top, the best of the best, the sum of all things, all creatures, until iniquity is found in him. And his beauty corrupted his wisdom as he looked in the mirror and said, man, I look good. Okay, that messes people up all the time today, too. So Isaiah, because they're just like their daddy, That's according to Christ says that, right? So Isaiah 14, verse 9, it says this. It says, or verse 12. I said verse 12. We'll start in verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? He said, yeah, man, you're... By the way, this is a chai. This is a... Uh, during the... At the second coming of Christ, when they're taking... When uh, this angel uh, that talks about the book of Revelation, who is just some ordinary angel. He's not Michael. He's nothing. Uh, he's, uh, his name is Joe. He's Joe Angel. Okay, so he's just a... Uh, just an everyday, probably, I would, I would expect he's probably the lo one of the lowest guys in the room, all right? And the idea is to really, because what God says through Paul, or actually Paul says, or, or through the Holy Spirit says through Paul, in 1 Corinthians, he's going to bring the knot 
the things that are by the things that are not, that are basically nothing. So God is bringing the nothing, bringing, bring, bringing the things that are, the things that exist. He's going to take nothing and make them nothing. Right? And by the way, you're the nothing. Okay? You're the body of Christ. That's how God's taking care of the heavenly places and the earth is through Israel and Christ is king. And Satan's going to be cast into this pit. And when he's cast into the bottomless pit here, he is, he, he's done, it's done by just some ordinary angel. No, no, doesn't need much strength at all to handle Satan because he's totally been defeated, as Pastor says, totally defeated. Anyways, for, so the, but anyways, there's a bunch of people standing around going, ah, <laughs> basically mocking him, okay? And that's what this mocking is. How art thou fallen from heaven, Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which is weak in the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, this is what you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt myself above the stars of God. I will sit, here's the key, also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like what? The most high. Now, uh, if you focus on the last part of that, I will be like the most high. You can uh, cross-correlate, cr cross-reference it to, I believe it's Genesis 14, somewhere in there. And what that means is he talks about Melchizedek, or uh, Melchizedek, or yeah. Talks about Melchizedek, whose king is possess or God is possessor of heaven and earth. Okay, the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And what Satan is saying is, that I'm going to possess it all. I'm going to possess heaven and earth. So who's the prince power of the air? Okay. okay. When Christ was on the earth, and uh, there were, he was led into the wilderness. After 40 days, he was tempted of the devil, and the devil says, "I'll give you all these kingdoms. They're mine." Christ didn't tell him, "No, they're not. They were." All right, because he was possessor of heaven and earth. What else did he want to do? If we back it up, he said, I will, verse uh, 14 says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. The clouds are the angels. They're going to be above them. I'm going to, they're going to, the idea is they're going to worship me. I'm at a level. They're going, to, they're going to worship me and not going to worship God. Verse 13 ends, the last part of the verse is, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. Congregation is a group. I mean, the, the, the group together. Job 1, when all the angels gather themselves together, the sons of God come together, that's the congregation, right? That word mount, you might think of it as a mountain, but it's not, it's not a mountain on the earth. It's either a mountain on another planet or it's the planet called, planet called congregation, all right? I, this is me. This is me, all right? I believe it's a planet called Congregation. And it tells you where it's at. It's in the sides of the north, right? So you go look north in the universe, all right? And if you take a look north, you'll find out there's a place where there aren't a lot of stars, all right? There aren't a lot of stars. And, you know, you look up because the universe sort of spins in a certain orientation, all right? Uh, and uh, you'll look, there's not a lot. But in the sides of somewhere up there, pretty far up, pretty close probably to uh, uh, the entrance to the third heavens, wherever that is. Okay, there's a planet called the side, called, planet called the congregation. And what Satan was saying is, I'm going to sit upon that mount, and I'm going to judge the angels, and they're going to give answer to me. You know, that's what he's saying. Okay. Verse 13, first, I will exalt myself at my throne above the stars of God. I'm going to rule over all the angels. Okay. And he says, by the way, wasn't Satan already in heaven? In the, you know, in the heavens? Yeah, right? So, I will ascend into heaven. He says, I'm going to be the top dog. What did Jesus Christ receive at the, uh, after he was crucified and rose from the dead? God gave him a name which is above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, both which are in heaven and earth and under the earth. So, he's thinking, everybody's going to worship, honor Christ. He is Lord, King of kings, all those things. So, Satan's saying, that's what I'm going to be. That's what I'm going to be. But I'm also going to be, I'm going to sit in the sides of the north, I'm going to, or in the Mount of Congregation, a planet. There's actually a couple planets that are mentioned in Scripture. That's one of them. Congregation's one. And that's the one that, um, that I believe is, this, you know, the congregation gets together for judgment. So where do I think the Bema seat's at? The judgment seat is? There. It's on the way to the third heavens. It's real close to the third heavens. It's way far north, all right? By the way, south is where the lake of fire's at way far south, all right, way far north is where uh, in the universe, uh, as things go, is where the, um, the Bema seat's at. I think it's the Mount of Congregation, all right? One last verse here. We've got a First Thessalonians. So, yeah, I know it is, okay. 
Door hasn't opened yet. Haven't heard snapping fingers yet. I'm okay for a minute. So, in First Thessalonians chapter one. So, um, after so so after the so what happens at the bema seat? Where are you given reward? You're given a position of authority in the body of Christ for the rest of eternity. All right. Uh, Jesus Christ is head. We're parts of the body. We are His body. We extend throughout the universe for never ever. After that, then I believe. And I think is what this teaches here. But First Thessalonians 3, verse 12, it says, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. To, you know, to, to the end purpose is, or, and, but before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Well, Christ doesn't come back here before God the Father. Christ is going up here to God the Father. So in the third, I'm going to put triangle. So I think we're taking third heavens and presented to God the Father. So after the judgment seat of Christ, there's something interesting about the body. Okay, Go over to Ephesians chapter 5, I think. 5, yeah, Ephesians 5. So in verse, um, verse 25, of husbands love your wives, even Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it. Christ gave himself for the church, where the husbands love their wives just like that. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So the, the, uh, the, the, the church, the body of Christ, is cleansed by the word. The word makes us like Christ. 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 3 or 4 there talks about as we look in, into a, uh, the glass, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory as God the Holy Spirit changes us in that glass. But verse 27, that, the purpose, he might present it to himself, what? A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and what? Without blemish. So we are now a glorious church. When we are... We still have that some, we have some, we need some works burn up, right? Some things need to be burned up yet. So that when that happens, when it's finished, there is nothing remaining of anything but pureness, right? All the wood, the hay, and the stubble that we've burned up, in our, or we've brought in our life has been burned up. And then God, Jesus Christ, takes us, presents us to God the Father as a glorious church, a perfect church, a holy church without spot, without blemish. And then we're there. For how long? No. <laughs> what? No. Oh, oh no. That's right. we're, we're now, so still, there's still another change. So, so now we're here. This is the third heavens. One more thing to go. All right, so we'll talk about that next time. Okay. So we don't stay there. Okay. In fact, there's a couple changes still happening, but we'll come back. We're going to come back, not here, but we're going to come back. So let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love, your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for your, your blessings. We praise you, Lord, for what uh, you're going to do in our lives today and every day. And, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for just who you are and your great love and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've been listening to the High Bandwidth Word Podcast, Transformative Studies in the Word of God. I hope you've enjoyed the study. Please subscribe, like, and comment. This podcast is available on many podcast platforms. Just search on the title. Now, until next time, fight the good fight of faith and God's best to you. Thank you.